Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks, and in this recording, I'm going to show how to make manipulations, modifications on nonlinear control system block diagrams uh, to put it into a more usable or easier to analyze format. This video is a, a continuation of a video I did on the same topic for linear systems. So I made modifications to this uh, similar in structure, a linear uh, system block diagram where it had these four LTI systems and two feedback loops, two summing junctions, and I showed how we could make uh, modifications to it one step at a time in order to get it in just one feed forward and a negative one unity negative feedback path as we progress through these steps and it ended up looking uh, like this at the end. So the a, B, C, D all condensed down to, you know, in the feed forward A times C over 1 minus A times B. Um, actually, I should say that. I shouldn't say that. I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, condensed down to this one. Uh, A times C over 1 minus A times B minus A times C plus A times B times C times C. Uh, and then a, uh, a unity negative feedback path. So um, that's what it condensed down to going through these step by step. Now, I want to do the same thing in this video, except for uh, there's uh, a nonlinear aspect or a switching aspect to this nonlinear system. Um, so a couple of things up front I want to say about this. Um, one is that it's a very, very simple uh, system. If you look at the dynamics of the system, there almost aren't any dynamics. Uh, if you look at A, it's unity. Uh, D, also unity. B, it's almost unity, it's just a delay. And C is the only thing of interest here. It's really the crux of the matter. It's a one bit quantizer. So it, it is a switching uh, device. And by switching, it's also it means it's nonlinear. So uh, one comment there is that, um, you know, this is not. Um, a video, you know, I'm not covering obviously exhaustively in any sense nonlinear system and how to treat them in terms of analysis. I'm covering a very, very specific use case. And that just so happens to be this use case of what's called a delta sigma modulator, which is a structure found in what's called oversampling ADCs and DACs or analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. Uh, the job of this delta sigma modulator in this case is to essentially chop up the input signal U here, I'm calling it, which has already been sampled in time. And it's going to chop it up into a square wave like format. It's going to be a bipolar signal. It's going to either be some maximum signal voltage or some minimum voltage uh, such that the average of that chopped up signal is close to, you know, approximately very, very close to the input signals, uh, instantaneous sample. So that just so happens to be, um, again, what's called a delta sigma modulator. It's a construct used in these oversampling or delta sigma based ADCs and DACs. It's a very efficient scheme uh, for, and very accurate, very linear scheme uh, for data conversion. It looks like it's uh, also a very roundabout way to go there. Instead of just using the input directly sample, uh, and quantizing it, we're quantizing actually some, um, you know, delta sigma modulated version of that sample. But it, again, it turns out without going into all the theory in this video that it's a very uh, efficient and linear way to do that when it comes to how you implement it um, in hardware. So the one extra step you need to do in practice, though, is that this signal here does not serve as your ADC or DAC DAC output, you've actually got to do some averaging or smoothing on it. And that's why I have this for decimation filter, this moving average filter, just to show you uh, that, you know, that's actually what's required uh, to, uh, in order to get a meaningful uh, sample out of such a converter. Um, all right. So let's see back to the, you know, really the step-by-step -step process. Uh, how do we take something with these two loops and these two summing junctions and get it into a format that's just one feed forward, you know, like some something for A and then just, you know, like unity in the feedback, negative feedback for, for, for B and get rid of all this stuff over here. 
All right, so let's just kind of step through uh, that process. Um, now, again, we know what A, B, and D are. Really, we only have to focus on C in this case. How do we treat the one-bit quantizer? And there's a number of ways to think about it. Uh, but, you know, I'm just going to kind of handle this more intuitively and not get so mathematically, you know, rigorous about it because it's really, it's fairly easy to think about and and uh, move on from there um one bit any quantizer you put any quantizer here let's think about it uh not just one bit one bit's kind of an extreme case uh where if you put in a signal let's say it's greater than zero you output some maximum voltage you output a signal that's less the input a signal less than zero you output some minimum voltage uh that's the extreme kind of quantizer uh use case but you could think about also the typical maybe use case you're thinking of a quantizer that's more like eight bits or 10 bits. It could, you know, just as a thought experiment, go up to 20 bits or 30 or 40 bits. At that point, whatever comes out of the quantizer is really um, an exact reproduction of what comes into it. If the quantization levels are small enough, you're essentially outputting exactly what came in to the input. And so by that measure, uh, a precise quantizer would just have, would be a gain of one. It just outputs what you put in. And really a one bit quantizer is the same thing. It just has more quantization error. And so really the mo a model, if we want to model the quantizer, uh, it's really a gain of one followed by some quantization error, which you could, let's say model as a disturbance input. So you could say something like this, I'll just, uh, call up this model where in one case up here, I've got a quantizer model. In the other case here, I just have a gain of one. And then I'm inputting quantization error to model the effect of that uh, separately. So you could do that. Now, in my case, in my model, I'm not trying to study the effect of the quantization error. I'm really only concentrating on the input uh, to output relationship uh, so much. But if you did want to model the quantization error as an external input, you would just do that and then model the quantizer as a gain of one. So pretty simple. All right, so back to our model. So let's go with the assumption that we're going to model the quantizer as a gain of one. Now, how do we get rid and how do we simplify this loop to just get down to one feed forward unity negative feedback? First thing I'm going to do is follow the same exact process I did in the linear system block diagram reduction video. I shift this quantizer block to the left of this branch here, uh, this junction, and then I try to, and then I have to make sure that the input to this summing junction, the inputs are preserved and the output is preserved. So that's sort of the next step. When I do that, I put it here. Well, the gain is unity and one over unity is just one. So I don't have to modify that. Uh, before I had, um, you know, just the output of the quantizer into the negative summing junction. And of course, I still have the output of the quantizer into the negative summing junction. So that part's been preserved. Now, the snag here is when I've done this change, while you could say mathematically valid in a linear system, it has broken the functionality of my nonlinear delta sigma modulator. And to see that, all we have to do is look um, at the fact that now I'm putting X in here and minus X in here, that effectively killed my feedback. This is always zero. And now I don't have any feedback. So now when I put in a signal, like let's say I put in 0.9 into this system, I'm going to uh, threshold that here. I'm going to quantize that to one. And it's always going to be one. I'm never going to be able to chop up the input into the square wave that on average takes on the value of the input. So it's not going to work. So and if we go back to the top uh, to the top original implementation, you can kind of just quickly go through this uh, in your head without even, you know, simulating. You can just say, well, if I put in 0.9, okay, I'm sampling in time here, not amplitude. Uh, I'm going to sample that. Uh, and again, I'm just using a constant here. You could use a time varying signal as well, just to make it simple. I'm using 0.9. Uh, put in 0.9, let's assume it starts up at zero here. This is going to be 0.9. We're going to quantize that to one over here. Uh, one, now we're going to subtract it from the input of 0.9. That's going to give me minus 0.1. Minus on the next time step, uh, we're going to subtract 
uh, 0.1 from 0.9, it's going to give me 0.8. That's going to still quantize to 1. We're going to subtract 1 from point from 0.8, that's going to give me minus 0.2. Then we're going to subtract on the next time step, 0.2 from 0.9, give us 0.7. So you can see how we're not stuck at one level in this loop. It's going to continually um, adapt uh, such that this signal on average is going to be the same as the input until basically this signal is going to eventually get smaller and smaller. That's going to flip the quantizer output. It's going to become a minus one, which is going to get flipped to one. We're going to add now one to the input and so on. Um, and then if you look, you know, we can we can run this model. Uh, we can see that the, um, I can turn on these other signals here. Um, we can see that the meet the quantized signal, which is the blue signal here, um, I shouldn't say that, I should, the, the, quant the quantizer output is the, um, the yellow the signal here, which is kind of a little bit hard to see with all the other waveforms on it. So maybe I will turn off, um, maybe we should turn off some of the other waveforms here. Let's just do that. Um, so the quantized signal is the one here in blue. And then the, um, the, the average of that or the effort decimation, you know, smooth version of the quantizer output is in either red or green. Now I don't have enough data on here so you can see the whole thing, but you can see how the smooth signal now hones in on the uh, average value of the blue signal, of the blue quantizer output. So it hones in on 0.9 quite accurately. All right, so, but this is not gonna happen down here on this implementation. It's also not gonna happen on this implementation. So if we look at it over here, uh, you can see it's just stuck at one. Great. No feedback. There's no feedback. Okay. So, but still this step was not in vain. It's still ultimately going to shed some light on what we can do about it. So again, so I did, so I made this uh, system kind of change by moving the quantizer here. No need to make changes here. I, now I do the same thing I did in my, the previous video. I, 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 instead of having this extra summing junction here, I shift this summing junction back here. And so now here I have a, um, a positive Z to the minus one feedback and a negative Z to the minus one feedback. I have the same thing here. I have a negative Z to the minus one feedback and a positive Z to the minus one feedback. Still, the output is zero. If we were to look at the output of this, it's still, I'm mean, still, the output is one. It's, it's not useful. We're not doing any chopping. We're not doing any Delta Sigma modulation. Now I'm going to move this to the feed forward, just like I did in the previous video. I'm going to put this Z the minus one in the feed forward path, but you have to, of course, account for the fact that you're moving from feed forward, feed uh, back to feed forward. That becomes one over one minus Z the minus one. When you move this, we still preserve our negative Z the minus one feedback, and we still have our quantizer here. When we do that, actually, it does preserve uh, the functionality of our original system. Uh, here you see the output of the fur decimator approaching the value of the input signal 0.9 right here quite accurately um so th this is this is essentially the final result right here this is the one that works now the interesting again observation in all this is that you have to be careful with nonlinear systems uh because uh, the order of operation matters you know which you do things so I, I, and I changed the order of operation. I moved this over here. That changes the order of operation. That changed the functionality. So in the end, I did have to do some, you know, manipulations, which didn't exactly seem like they were leading anywhere. But once I shifted the uh, positive Z to the minus one back into the, uh, this on one side of the accumulator, then things worked. I, you know, again, uh, I didn't run a test, but you know, if you start swapping these components around, it's not going to work the same anymore again because it's a nonlinear system. Whereas if you had a linear system, you could swap this first and have this second, and it would still work. All right, that's mostly, I think, entirely all I wanted to say about this. I appreciate your attention, and, and I uh, hope it was helpful. Thank you very much. Signing off.